So I've been asked to spend a few minutes uh, talking about this, uh, this book that I wrote called Return on Influence. And what I've examined in this book is what are the differences in how people acquire power and influence in the real world, like we're here today, in our carbon-based forms, uh, compared to how people are beginning to acquire power and influence on the internet. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting because if you think how much of our influence in our world comes because uh, we're on an organizational chart, or we have a title, or maybe we've gone to a certain university. Well, on the internet, none of that matters. People hate rules on the internet. They hate organizational charts. And if you ever try to tell somebody what to do on the internet, you're going to get uh, a lesson pretty quickly that nobody's in charge. And they don't want to have anybody in charge. And yet, people are uh, undoubtedly becoming powerful on the web. So I want to tell you a story about how I started thinking about this. And this was my own uh, experience about uh, a little over two years ago now. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this company called Clout. It's K-L-O-U-T. And they have the audacity to say, we are going to try to measure your influence based on what you're posting on the web and how people are responding to you. So uh, this created quite an outbreak. <laughs> and uh, the, some of the people that were commenting on my post said, uh, uh, Mark, I, will, I hope you will join me in stopping this. This is un-American, that anybody would try to rate our influence. And the other thing that happened is this, art, this, this article that I wrote, it spread. It was tweeted over a thousand times. So it went beyond my network and it started going into other people's networks. And thousands and thousands of people read this article. And about three weeks after I wrote the article, I got a call from a reporter from the New York Times. She said, uh, Mr. Schaefer, I've been researching this new trend, this new marketing trend, and when I Googled it, I found your article, I read your article, I thought it was really interesting. Can I interview you for the New York Times? Of course, my answer was, <laughs> duh. <laughs> you know that term here, right? <laughs> so, uh, I was interviewed uh, in the New York Times. I, and, and my quote appeared four times, and it gets crazier because the New York Times is syndicated. It went all over the country. I was quoted four times in this article. It gets even crazier. It, was, it goes all over the world. So I'm in newspapers all over the world. Even the London Daily Mail, that's not me. <laughs> I know your attention goes right to that. But it's not me. It just happened. In fact, you know what? I, I should just cut and paste this out and put me in there. But uh, I would, So they rewrote the article and took my quotes, and I was in the London Mail. And then that was syndicated. And that was going all over the place. So I started thinking about this. And I started wondering, why me? Why me? Now, this was before I wrote the book, okay? I had written one book, but it was just starting to go. I don't have a degree from Oxford University. I've never been in a movie. I've never been elected to office. Uh, I've never played for Manchester United, or, you know. Uh, I've never been a supermodel. It might be hard to believe, believe it or not. <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> it was funny. When I gave the talk earlier this week, I, m I mentioned that, and, these, and the, this whole group of IBM, they just started laughing. I thought, why would they laugh at that? <laughs> they just brought the house down. And I would mention that I wasn't a supermodel, but I guess it's that obvious. So anyway, I, go, I, I began thinking about how did I become an influencer? And I, I, I wasn't born from a family of wealth. I, I came from a very poor family, actually. And uh, so I started studying this. And I came across this model. Some of you probably know this, the, the author, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Dr. Robert Cialdini has written several books on influence. He's the foremost authority on influence in the world. 
uh, he actually left his position as a university instructor and went undercover for three years doing different jobs at companies to do research on how people become powerful at work. So he came up with this model called the Six Weapons of Influence. And he said, when you become influential at work, it's for one of these six reasons. But as I started to study this and read the academic research and, and, and talk to people, I discovered something was missing, that there's actually a seventh weapon. We'll get to that in a minute. So in the first half of my book, I look at how do these six factors show up on the internet? What's different now? What's the same? What's different? And what I found is there are vast differences. Now, I just have a few minutes today, and I can't go through all of this, but I want to give you an example around social proof. So what is social proof? In the real world, sometimes we can have an air of power or influence just by how we look or what's in our offices. So in the absence of truth, in the absence of facts, we look around our environment for clues as to what to do and to who's in charge. So we might look at what kind of car do they drive? What do they have hanging in their office? Uh, how are people dressed? If, if I came in here in a police uniform, you'd probably, you, you'd think, ooh, this, this is, well, you'd think it was very strange, but you'd know it wasn't a supermodel at that point. But. <laughs> so, and, and so one example of this is there, there's this doctor. Maybe you had this TV show here, Marcus Welby, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an actor named Robert Young. Now, in his autobiographical writings, he, he reflected back and he said he was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, he was a terrible father, he was a terrible husband, he was depressed, and he tried to commit suicide twice. And yet, he was the most popular advertising spokesperson on American <coughs> television for 20 years. Why? Because he played a doctor on TV. Mm -hmm. He wore a lab coat. And in his commercials, he wore a lab coat. And I can even remember my grandmother saying, oh, I just love that Dr. Marcus Welby. I said, you know that's not really a doctor. <laughs> but there was this strong association of authority and power and influence just because he wore a lab coat. Now, here's the difference. In the real world, we can figure that out. Okay, We can figure out by talking to them, by meeting them over lunch, is this person kind of a fake who just dresses nice and wears a fancy car, or is this someone we really should respect? The difference is, on the internet, we don't do that. We are overwhelmed by information density. I heard this statistic the other day, that uh, in the last two years, as much information has been created and put on the internet as in the history of the human race all put together. I don't know if that's true or not. I make up about 56.6% of my statistics anyway. <laughs> but it sounds about right. And I think you, you see that yourself, that the amount of information out there, it's incredibly difficult. And it's getting more dense every day. I live in a small town, 600,000 people in Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee. I googled Knoxville pizza and got 8 million results. That is just ridiculous. We don't need that. So on the internet, people look for these badges. They look for these numbers. They look for clues as to the social proof. And in the short term, the numbers may be more important than what you actually do. It's like walking into an empty restaurant. If you walk into an empty restaurant at, at uh, uh, eight, eight o'clock in the evening, you think something's wrong. But if there's lots of people there, that's social proof. I've made the right decision. If you see two articles and one on the same subject and one has been tweeted twice and one has been tweeted 200 times, which one will you read? And even though the first one may be the superior article, the social proof is, I only have time to read one. Go here. So that's how social proof operates as, 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 as power and influence. So that's one of the traditional weapons. And yet, something was missing. So I interviewed Dr. Cialdini for my book. 
And I said, Dr. Cialdini, I think there's, there's a seventh weapon of influence. And he said, you are right. And this is content. Because now we all have the ability to publish. We, have the, we all have a voice. And the thing that's exciting is that this can only be happening now. We've had these two technological enablers come together just in the last few years. Uh, you know, I was walking around downtown and I see Wi-Fi everywhere. This has just happened in the last few years, right? And it's becoming global. The other one is these free, easy-to-use publishing tools like Facebook and Twitter and blogging. They're free. They're, they're, they're very simple to use. And now everybody can publish. I want to give you an example of how this really works. This is an example about a, a friend of mine named Robert. He grew up in a very, very poor family in New Jersey. And when he was a young man, his family moved to the Silicon Valley, moved to California. Uh, and can you imagine what that was like in the 80s? You know, all the excitement. He wanted to be part of this. He wanted to be part of this industry and excitement, but he didn't know how to do it. You see, he didn't have a college degree. He dropped out of school. He wasn't a, a, you're exact, a, exactly like a business type. He was very shy, very nerdy. He didn't have any money. He didn't come from a family of wealth, so he couldn't start a company, couldn't invest in a company. So after he dropped out of school, he became a clerk in a camera store. That's the only job he could find. Then he discovered blogging. So he would sit at his computer each day and write about his observations of this growth and this excitement in Silicon Valley. And this was the way he could connect to the people and the ideas and the gadgets and the products of Silicon Valley, even though you know, he, wasn't, you know, he wasn't employed. So he started blogging once a month, then once a week, then every day, then multiple times a day, because there was so much going on. And an amazing thing happened. People started to pay attention. Dozens, hundreds, thousands. Eventually, tens of thousands of people are reading this guy's blog. He's having an impact on Silicon Valley just through his words, and companies start to notice. They start inviting him to their product launches. They're saying, you come behind the velvet curtain with the big shots. They start sending him free computers, software, hardware, gadgets, because they know that this guy's becoming powerful and just a mention of a new product or a new service or a new company in this guy's blog could really help the company. In fact, in one famous example, he quadrupled the traffic to one startup company's blog, uh, website in 24 hours. Quadrupled it with one blog post. And that was over a Christmas holiday. Now think about, how is he doing this? It's not because of his education. It's not because of his wealth. Here's what he can do almost better than anybody. He can create content that moves through his network and beyond. That's the source of his power. And this is a guy named Robert Scoble. He's the most famous tech blogger in the world. He, at one time, he was the blogger for Microsoft. He's built his entire career based on his ability to create content that moves. So if you think about, I mean, how did I show up in the New York Times? It's because I created content that moved, all right? And that is the source of a lot of people's power today. That could be the source of power and influence for companies, for brands, for nonprofits, even for governments. Here's an example of, uh, I didn't realize this till I was almost through with the book, but I highlight a number of people in my book who are what I call the new citizen influencers. This is the era of the citizen influencer. And influence has been democratized now because anybody has the ability, has the opportunity to publish and have their voice become known. This was a young lady uh, who lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and she started blogging after she had her first baby. She actually became, was suffering from depression. So she was blogging to overcome her depression, and just like Robert, her, her authentic voice just connected with thousands and thousands of people 
who just, and she was just very honest. This is how I'm struggling. This is what I'm going through. But it wasn't just other mothers that paid attention to her. It was organizations like World Vision. And World Vision said, her name actually is Nish. Nish from Nashville. I couldn't make that up. <laughs> so they said, P you have something special here. You have a special voice. We would like to fly you to Bolivia and write about what's going on with our work there and the orphanages in Bolivia. And through her blog, uh, again, never went to college. And I, 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 I didn't discover this until I was almost through the book, that all the people I profiled in the book, none of them had gone to college, not a single one. And uh, now she helped get 150 children sponsored through World Vision Organization, just through the words that she's writing on her blog. So this is a very important point, that content that moves, and, and this is the, a difference, it's a big difference, that a lot of organizations understand the idea of content. We need to blog, we need to do videos, we need to have photos, but igniting that content that's the more difficult part. How do we get that content to move through the network? How do we attract a group of people around us to help share that content? Content. How do we even ignite the people in our own organization to help ignite the content? So this is a legitimate source of influence and power. It's unique to the internet. It's unique to now. Now, the other interesting thing that's going on is that companies are beginning to actually figure out, they're trying to figure out, can we measure this? So the first idea is, uh, can you measure content that moves, okay? So uh, this is Pee Wee Herman. He's kind of an obscure American comedian. He's kind of a silly guy. And I'm embarrassed to say that the most popular blog post I ever wrote was the 20 stupidest things you can do on Twitter. Now, I'm an academic, and I try to write really smart things on my blog, but I got silly one time, and I wrote this blog post, The 20 Stupidest Things You Can Do on Twitter, and it was, whoops, it was tweeted by P.B. Herman. He has two million followers. It crashed my servers. My blog, my website went down. So, can you measure how the content moves? Yes, you can look at the numbers. You know, I knew that day he brought the peewee heat to my blog. And, <laughs> and the content moved. You can measure that, okay? Then the other idea is how do you create a reaction? Are people reacting to this? Well, what about if your content gets tweeted or posted on Facebook or retweeted or someone clicks on a link or someone comments on your blog? Those are all discrete activities that can say someone is reacting. We're having an impact in, in, you know, through our content. So the second big idea is that if you, can, if you can, to the extent that you can measure how the content moves and measure these reactions, you could measure influence. Not all influence. It doesn't measure how influential you are at work. It doesn't measure how influential you are at home. It doesn't measure how influential you are, influential you are with your 12-year-old daughter, which is zero. But it can look at one sliver of influence. Can you move content? And if you think about business today, if you think about our world today, isn't that an increasingly important activity that we can demonstrate? We create content that spreads and shares, people share, and create a reaction, okay? So this is quite an interesting concept that for the first time, we can begin to measure influence on a mass scale. And that's what companies are doing. And you're probably thinking, how can this get any more exciting? It is gonna get more exciting, because I'm gonna talk about these companies who are, are doing this. So uh, we have one actually based in the UK, Peer Index is based in London. Clout is in San Francisco, and then Craig, Craig, Craig and, and Opinions is based in New York. But, and they're all basically trying to do the same thing. There are many companies that are doing this. They're slicing and dicing all this data, all these billions of pieces of content, and they're looking at three things. Is this a person or is this an organization 
that can create content that moves. Is the content moving? Are we measuring this? What are they talking about? So what are the topics of influence? Is it economic policy? Is this when this person tweets or posts or blogs about economic development? Does it get a reaction? And then they're also looking at who is reacting. Are you influencing the influencers? Are other people who are influential about economic policy sharing your content? So that goes into the formula as well. And they come up with a number. So some companies have two numbers, some companies have three numbers, some companies have multiple numbers based on your different topics of influence, but they're all basically doing the same thing. It's almost like a credit score for influence. It's an indicator of how well you can move content. So we can also get other insights about this. And I use a, kind of a benign product like Listerine, which is you know the mouthwash, okay? To kind of to give you an example that there are influential people out there even talking about Listerine. And we can start to, to, to now monitor this to see, well, look, here is the conversation about oral care. There are actually experts out there talking about oral care. And there are some people talking about Listerine. And to the extent they overlap, Listerine is part of the conversation. But look how much of the conversation they're not part of. And one idea might be 75% of the conversations are taking place on blogs. 82% of the conversations about Listerine are taking place on Twitter. So as a, as a manager of this company, we can now see maybe we need to be spending time with blogs. And you can do this type of analysis for any type of topic, any type of organization, and we can do it very inexpensively and very quickly. So it's, it's a new opportunity. We can then click down to see who are the people actually having these conversations. We can then click down even more and see a profile of these people. We can see what are they saying? Where are they saying it? What is the sentiment about this? So if you want to, if you want to look at a certain industry, you know, like high tech or software development, you can even find the influencers in Europe, in the UK, in Ireland, in wherever, you know, whatever subject that you're interested in. And then you can, I, what if you had content that you wanted them to spread? You'd build these relationships to help do that. You can even see over time, and in this example, both the volume of the conversations about Listerine and oral care have gone up and the sentiment has gone up. So as a company, I'd want to know why, what happened? Why are people all of a sudden talking about Listerine in a good way? Maybe we can capitalize on that. So again, this is a, kind of a simple example and a silly example, but it shows the power now we have uh, to look at this big data and start to distill some interesting things out of it. So a big idea is that you know, we don't have to be celebrities or, or movie stars or athletes anymore. Uh, this is the era of uh, the citizen influencer. This is a guy I profile in my book. I said, this is the new face of uh, influence. He's a graphic designer, works for the city of Los Angeles. He's very, very shy. Uh, 42, never went to college, learned how to do his coding at a trade school. He describes himself as a social media hoe because he tweets more than 200 times a day. He's like a human RSS feed. But his 80,000 followers on Twitter love him because he says, I just want to help people. If I find someone who's suffering, I want to find someone that can help. If someone is, is, needs exposure for their charity, I want to help spread their content. So in a world where the average clout score is 40, he is an 80. And as you can see by his new avatar, it's starting to get to his head. So now brands and companies are reaching out to him. When Audi introduced their new A8 into the United States, they didn't call Brad Pitt. They didn't call Angelina Jolie. They called Calvin. Calvin, take our car. Try our car. And what's he doing the whole time? He's posting, he's tweeting, he's taking pictures. I've learned that Instagramming is now a verb. He's Instagramming all along. He's driving it up and down the west coast of, Calif the coast of California. He was invited to a, a big celebrity uh, auction at the House of Blues. They comped him a room in a casino. He got to hobnob with all the celebrities. 
the VH1 Awards, sent a limousine for him and seven of his friends to attend the VH1 Awards. He's getting so much stuff from companies and brands who want to tap into him. He's created a Pinterest page called My Daily Swag. And one of the things I talk about in the book is that this is going mainstream, that brands and companies are now starting to figure out we need to tap into these people who can spread content. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned is that even I experienced clout envy for the first time. Who got tickets to see Jay-Z at South by Southwest and who didn't? So uh, now uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the formula. This is not the formula on how to increase your influence. This is what you get when you Google complicated looking math formula. <laughs> but there, there's lots of academic research about this right now because it is such a hot topic. And this is uh, the, the end of my uh, conversation and I'd be happy to take your questions. But if you look at the academic research, there are basically three things that you need to do, three strings that you can pull to uh, increase your influence. And you can't do one of them or two of them. You have to do all three. Now, as we talked about, most people get the idea around content. Content is the catalyst that makes things happen. One of the nice things about this organization is you're rich in content. You have a, your website is amazing. You have so much wonderful content, which is a good thing because I go into a lot of companies and organizations and they look at each other and they said, how do we tell our story? We're not generating content. You are generating content. So that's usually the hard part, but you have lots of, you have a great story to tell. You have lots of great content. The piece that a lot of people miss is this idea about the relevant audience. So, you've got the content, but are you actively, systematically connecting to people around the world who would be interested in hearing from you? Are you building relationships with people who would be interested in your content and interested in sharing your content? So a lot of people overlook that. And in, in my books, I, I spend a lot of time uh, with lots of ideas on how do you find those people? How do you connect with those people? But you're not really leveraging the value of the content unless you get it to move, unless you get it to ignite. It's just sitting there. It's not creating conversations. So you've got to find the relevant audience that will help you move it. Then the last part is consistent engagement is that social media is social. They want to know about you. They want to hear from you. You've got to be out there. You've got to be connecting. You've got to be part of the conversation. Maybe, you need, in, in addition to them coming to see your content, maybe you also need to go visit them, wherever they are too, and build those relationships. Um, so that is really the end of my talk. I wanted to end with one last story. It's one of my final stories to illustrate this power of the citizen influencer. And this is a young lady uh, who had uh, uh, graduated from college. Her name is Molly Catchpole. And uh, just like you know, we have here in, in Ireland, we've got an unemployment problem in many parts of the United States as well. She could not find a job. So she was really struggling and her struggles turned to crisis when it was time, she had to start paying back her student loans. So she was just taking any part-time job that she could. She became a part-time nanny. And then one day, she got a letter in the mail from the Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the world, and said, Dear Ms. Cashpole, thank you for being a loyal customer. We'd like to inform you of a new policy. Unless you have an average daily balance in your account of $20,000, we're going to assess you a $5 a month monthly fee just to access our money. And she just thought this was so wrong. And she felt disheartened. And she felt angry. And she felt tired. And she started tweeting about this. She started blogging about this. And one of her friends on Twitter said, you know, there's this organization called change.org where you can create a petition and get other people to know that this, what this bank is doing is wrong. So she created this online petition and the content began to spread. In fact, in two weeks, 
she had 300,000 people sign a petition. And in three weeks, the bank reversed their policy. This 22-year-old part-time nanny had stopped the biggest bank in America in its tracks. This couldn't have happened five years ago. It's a new time. It's a new day. She had found her return on influence. This was her time. This is my time. This is your time. There's, there, there's an opportunity for all of us and every organization to capture this opportunity and find their return on influence too. And here is my uh, uh, contact information. If you want to stay in touch with me, I'd love to hear from you on Twitter or my blog. And if I went too fast, if I have any questions that I don't get to today, I'd be delighted to stay in touch with you. You can drop me an email and let me know how I can help you. So, thanks very much.